So you're trying to decide if you should get the a7 IV. I ended up making an unpopular decision from swapping out of the Sony a7S III for the a7 IV about a year ago. Used it a ton and I see it being my main camera in 2023. The a7 IV is an incredible offering to say the least. 10-bit 422 color, S-Log3 and s cinetone 33 megapixels for photos, dual native ISO, the updated color science, the new menu system, a full-size HDMI port, this little rocker switch that makes jumping from photo to video incredibly efficient, auto white balance lock, ridiculously sharp 4K video downsampled from 7K, 4K and full HD slow motion in 10-bit color, a camera body that is very similar to the a7S III, a fully articulating screen, touch tracking autofocus, and class leading autofocus in general. In this video, I'm gonna review all of the main reasons as to why I made that switch, and I think it's gonna help you out a ton in making a decision on the Sony a7 IV and how that decision was actually very simple for me and it came down to one very specific thing. This video doesn't have a sponsor. It is, however, supported by all of you who choose to take advantage of the things that I promote. Like audio, where I get all of my copyright-free sound effects and music that I've been using a lot recently. Not only are they really cool people over there at audio, I think they are incredibly underrated. There's a special link below where you can save on what I find to be already very affordable rates. Here we go, photos. Photography is important to me. And after years of shooting with the 24 megapixel Sony a7 III, I upgraded to the a7S III, which only has 12 megapixels for photos. Although I enjoyed using the S3 for video, I found that lower resolution left me wanting more when it came to photography. That's why I'm thrilled with the 33 megapixel capability of the a7 IV. Even though I primarily use this camera for video, I also need it for photography in various contexts, such as YouTube thumbnails, brand work, personal social media or website content, and travel photography. The a7 IV meets all of these needs with outstanding results. Now, while the A1 might be better for professional sports photographers who need higher frames per second, and the A7R5 is great for those who need the highest resolution possible for large print work or a significant reason to crop in on the photos and maintain as much detail as possible. But for most of us, the A7 IV strikes a perfect balance. Its autofocus is reliable and the color reproduction is excellent. I provided a link below that gets you free access to my clean and minimal gym Lightroom preset, which I've used on a few of those photos that we were just looking at. And it actually works really well on photos that have nothing to do with the gym. Anyways, you're welcome. The color. A lot of people say that Sony colors suck. I disagree. And I look at a lot of people using the A7S III or the A7 IV or the FX3 and think that the colors look excellent. I would agree that Sony colors used to be a bit off and I had a lot of experience with that using the A7 III. But when Sony put 422 10-bit color in the A7S III, I noticed how good it was immediately. The a7 IV also shares that same 422 10-bit color and I really think that Sony has arrived when it comes to color especially in this hybrid camera market with cameras like the Canon R6 Mark II, the Panasonic Lumix S5 II. So when people say that Sony colors suck and decide not to get a camera like the a7 IV because of that, I think they're going off of an old reputation that just isn't the case anymore. When you pair that 10-bit 422 color with S-Log3 and the a7 IV, I think you get an image that is both color accurate and has a really nice look to it. This camera also has the desirable S Cinetone picture profile available and a lot of people like it because it's nice straight out of camera. The autofocus. Look, the autofocus in the a7 IV is incredibly reliable for both photos and videos. I can't remember a time using this camera where I've ever had to doubt the capabilities of the autofocus. And I'm self shooting the majority of the time, so having a camera that I can count on to grab focus and stick to the subject is incredibly valuable. It also has the touch to track autofocus, just like in the a7S III, and this is one of those features that I use for almost everything. Low light. 
To put it simply, this camera's performance in low light has exceeded my expectations and has even been comparable to, and at times maybe even better than the a7S III. This is particularly impressive given the a7S III's reputation for low light capabilities. I frequently shoot in dimly lit environments such as gyms and have been pleased with the low noise, accurate colors, and sharp focus that this camera produces, even at higher ISOs. This is likely due to the dual base ISO feature, which I first encountered in the a7S III. And while the specific values differ between the two cameras, the concept remains the same. By multiplying the base ISO by four, which for S-Log3 is 800 times 4, 3200, a second base ISO is created with similar low noise levels as the base ISO. And as ISO gain is increased, noise is gradually introduced from there. This allows for strong performance at high ISOs, which is a significant advantage of this camera. The video quality, in a word, sharp. The video quality out of this camera is very sharp and very crisp. I'll attribute this to the fact that the 4K image that we're seeing is being downsampled from 7K. We also have a few different codecs available here. XAVC SI is arguably the highest quality, but also the largest, and by largest, I mean massive file size. It also has the XAVC HS codec, which will require you to have a computer that can handle those H.265 files. This is actually my codec of choice choice because the files are high quality, they're significantly smaller than the all intra XABC SI that we just talked about. And if you have an M1 or M2 chip in your Mac, these files are incredibly smooth to work with and edit. And what would a Sony camera be without the classic XABC S codec, which is nice to work with and it has high quality and the file sizes are also small. And if you're trying to decide like, well, what's the difference between them? I'm having a hard time identifying the actual quality differences between the three but I'll let, uh, I'll let you be the judge. Let's talk about slow motion. This camera does get knocked for its 1.5 times crop when shooting in 4K 60. And here is what that 1.5 times crop is gonna look like. It's an issue. And like a lot of you, I wish it didn't have that crop but that doesn't mean that it doesn't take excellent slow motion footage. I shoot in 4K 60 often, and you have to remember that 4K 60 is being downsampled from 4.6K, which makes the quality and low light performance better than you might think. Also, the 1080 60P is outstanding. It still has 10 bit color. And although it does lack in some sharpness, I still find that I can use it on a 4K timeline and feel confident in the result. Quick tip for you to help with that sharpness, when I'm shooting in 4K, I bring the sharpness in the picture profile down to minus one. When I'm shooting in 1080, I bring it up to plus two. No video record time limit. Previously, I used the a7 III, which had a record limit of 30 minutes, requiring me to set a timer on my phone and try to capture the entire shot within that time frame. This limitation proved to be challenging when shooting long format interviews or tutorials or presentations where uninterrupted footage is essential. Thankfully, the a7 IV, just like the a7S III, doesn't have a record time limit, which is a significant advantage. The hybrid toggle. This camera is targeted as a hybrid camera, meaning that it performs well for both photo and video. And this little toggle switch is the epitome of that, a switch Sean, are we seriously talking about a little rocker switch being a big difference about this camera? Yes, it actually saves a lot of time when you're switching between photos and videos. One thing you'll wanna do though is customize this setting so that when you switch between photo and video modes, your settings like shutter speed, ISO, etc., will stay completely separated between photos and videos. We'll call this category just completely random because there are a few small things about this camera that actually make a big difference. The white balance toggle. When the camera is in auto white balance, you can map one of your custom buttons to lock and unlock the white balance. This is a feature that I was first introduced to on the a7S III and decided that I will not get a camera without it. So I was happy to see that it was on the a7IV. I use it all of the time and think that it's a big time saver and a really nice way to keep your colors consistent when you're not shooting in controlled lighting environments. A full size HDMI, simple one here, but for those of you who use an external monitor and you know the struggles of using 
using and breaking those dumb little micro HDMI cables, yeah, full size is certainly the way to go. The updated menu system. When I first switched from the A7 III to the A7S III, one of the most noticeable like quality of life features was the new menu system, which yes, is also in the A7 IV. A fully articulating flip out screen. For any type of vlogging or self shooting in general, this is critical and it's really nice to have, especially when you combine it with the touch tracking for autofocus. So after all of that, who should get it? I guess that's easier to answer when asking the question, who shouldn't get it? Anyone who needs cropless 4K slow motion should not get the A7 IV. Maybe you shoot real estate and need very wide angles and you want the highest quality possible and you don't wanna deal with that crop. Maybe you need raw output video to an external monitor. And if either of those are the case, go with the A7S III. If you need ridiculously high resolution for photos, for print, or for heavy crops, don't get it and go with the A7R5 instead. If you need something with much higher frames per second for photos because you're professionally shooting sports, shell out the cash and get the A1. For anyone else, the A7IV is exceptional at being a hybrid camera. Maybe you're upgrading from a crop sensor Sony camera like an A6500. It could also be your first camera. It has a big price tag to it, so you should know that you wanna get into this but you're gonna be able to grow into it over time. It's gonna last you a lot of years. So for me, like I said, what was that simple one thing it came down to when I was deciding between the A7S III and the A7 IV? I asked myself one fundamental question because I don't need raw output from the A7S III and many of the other features in the A7 IV and the A7S III are identical. My question was this, do I prioritize cropless 4K slow motion or better photos? Ultimately, I opted for the A7 IV since I was comfortable with the crop in 4K slow motion and saw that that 1080 footage, while it's still in 10-bit color, is completely usable for what I need. And I prefer the superior photo quality over the A7S III. And that decision has proved to be the right one over the past 12 months of heavily using this camera. If you're out there trying to decide between this camera and the Lumix S5 II, you're gonna wanna check out this video because it's a really tough decision. I broke down all of my thoughts there. Take care. See ya.